Good morning and welcome to the River Center. We're happy to be with you this morning, even if it is by video. We're so excited to, for the day when we can all be together again. But for now, I'm just glad that we can still worship together. And even as we're singing these songs, we're worshiping the same God in the same spirit. So if you'll just join us this morning as we sing these songs. Good morning, River Center. Here we are again on a Sunday morning. Yes. And 
we keep seeing the same people here filming with us and um which is nice it's nice it's great to see them but we really wish we could see all of you we miss seeing you it's not fair <laughs> but we're on the countdown now to yes, being together right. so in a in a we'll, we'll see how that all turns out but when is that date June 7th, Warren yes. sent out an email today, so we're excited to hear that news and excited to be progressing into a different phase, so uh, looking forward to that, but this morning we just wanted to welcome you and say thanks for joining us today. You know, we just sang a song, How Great Is Our God, and that song is so powerful, and even though we might not be, you know, in the same building right now, uh, just that thought that we can that God is great right where you are and how awesome that is and and we do look forward to times together but but it, we don't have to wait today God wants to do something in your life in your home with your family with your kids so so get ready um, we're gonna sing some songs we're gonna do communion here in just a little bit uh, we're gonna take communion together that'll be fun I'm um, Gary and Vaughn are gonna talk about giving and and Dennis is going to give us some announcements, and it just kind of connects us together. And, you know, I, I just hope that even during this time that you're taking advantage of what God is doing, that he is He's awesome, even right now where you are. So, amen. Thanks for joining us this morning. We look forward to the service. From my enemies till all my fears are gone. And I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child.
This morning, we're going to be taking communion together. So if you need a, a second to run and grab the elements, do that right now as we, we walk through this together. But it's just, it's awesome just to be able to remember the Lord's table this morning. Uh, like I said, even though we're not in the same place, that this Jesus Christ is with us right where we are. So, um, amen. So Kim, why don't you just go ahead and read that first verse for us. 
Yeah, so if you would read with us in 1 Corinthians 11, 24 through 26, in the New Living Translation, it says, And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. You know, this morning we want to mention three things that help us as we take communion together. Um, the, the first is that while we take communion, we're doing this to honor Jesus, to honor what he did in sacrificing himself for us. Is that we realize that, that he, because of his actions, the power of sin was dealt with. And we want to honor that fact, that, that truly Jesus Christ has done a marvelous thing um, when we come together in taking communion. And secondly, we come to the communion table with a heart of repentance. It's here that we can talk with God to be transparent, to confess our sins, give praise, and share our love for the Lord. It's about being real, coming just as we are. Yeah, that's really good. And then, then lastly, communion is a covenantal experience. It, it's, it's a family's coming together. It's, it's that we're joined together, the church body, with Christ Jesus. And so it's this expression of, of knowing that we are together as a family of believers, sitting at the Lord's table, where there's fellowship, where there's, where there's connectivity, where we're expressing the things that, that we're going through, and we're sharing together in his death and in his, and in his resurrection. So, so this morning, um, let's just start by taking the bread, and I'll be praying over that. So take a moment, go grab the bread, and then we'll just take this together. So let's just bow our heads in prayer. Amen. Heavenly Father, we just thank you, dear Jesus. Lord, we just love you so, so much. We're so thankful that you walked the road to Calvary. You did what we failed to do, living a life perfectly united to God, our Father. We honor you today by remembering you. We stand transparent before you. Thank you, Jesus, for making us whole. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Let's take the bread. Now, let's take the juice that represents the blood of Christ. So, run, get a little bit of juice for your family. And let's pray together. Dear Jesus, we thank you, God, for willing, willingly going to the cross for us. We understand that you are the perfect sacrifice for sin. And it's your perfect blood that cleanses us from all unrighteousness. God, thank you for forgiving us and for going to the cross for us. In your name, we pray. Let's take the cup. You know, I've asked the team, we're going to close this time of worship by singing that song again, How Great Is Our God. So just enter in as we sing this together.
Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. River Center family, we Hi. miss you. We miss you. Yeah. yeah. Hope you're all doing well. Thanks for tuning in today. Vaughn and I have the privilege of uh, talking about giving today. And so uh, I'm going to read a passage, and then she's going to read a passage from the same passage. And then, uh, and then we'll just finish with some comments. So in Philippians chapter 4, Paul says, he's, he's thanking the church for their gift. And he says, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. And I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. For I can do all things through him who gives me strength. Paul's saying, you know, he's writing this from a, a difficult circumstance, but he said, I, I thank you for your gifts. I thank you for your giving. You're helping extend the kingdom. But as for me, I've learned that whether I have a, I've earned a lot from making my tents or I'm in the situation that I'm in now and I'm asking you to help me and you've been, you've been able to do that. Whatever the circumstance, I'm content. And then he says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It's interesting that at the end of learning to be content, he lumps in everything else. So it's pretty high on the list. Now, Vaughn is going to give you a key to why he could live that way. Well, in Philippians 4, then verses 8 and 9, it says, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is adm admirable. If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think on such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. I don't know, we were talking about how um, during this time, um, it's so important to make sure that our minds are in the right place that we keep our minds set upon him. And, you know, I think it's been a scary time for some people. I think that, there, I know that there's people that have lost their jobs mm -hmm. or um, have been laid off during this time. And so I think it's hard. I think finances can be all consuming if, if you lack. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but God is saying there that we need to keep our minds set upon him Think about things that are holy and true and noble and pure mm -hmm. and keep our minds set on the right in the right place. Yeah. And then it says that um, we need to, the peace of God then is going to be with us. The peace of God then comes. Yes. And, uh, and she mentioned a, an important word. She said, even when we're in lack, and some people are right now, yeah. and some people might be doing well, their business, they might have something that people are really needing during this time, and maybe they're in abundance. But um, it's up to us to make sure that we're doing what we can with the right heart, uh, thinking right about giving. Yeah. So that in whatever situation we find, our zone, find ourselves in, we can be content. Yeah. Doesn't say satisfied, but it does say content. Yes. So, yeah. Father, we take the offering today mm -hmm. as the givers give. Bless, Lord. Let our hearts and our minds be set on your kingdom. You promised. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all of our natural needs will be met. So we trust you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We look forward to seeing you soon. Yeah. Hey, you got an email about that. Just fill out the survey. Bye. God bless. See you Bye. soon. Hey, good morning, church. How's it going? Uh, you'll never guess where I am. I am actually in front of our church. I'm actually going in to our church as we speak, through the front doors. You will be too, June 7th. We're gonna be getting back together. Now it's gonna be a little bit different. Um, we'll have more details coming out next week. We're gonna walk right through these big doors and we're gonna get together again. So that's really exciting. Also, June 11th, Obri is doing their banquet. Now they do an annual banquet with food and hosts and it's really fun. But we can't do that right now. So we're going to do it online. 
going to be a virtual banquet. You guys, make sure you connect with that and support them in every way possible. It's really important. Um, they're, they're going through some struggle with this COVID-19, just like everybody else is, you know, so try to help them out. Oh, also, before I let you go, Warren uh, put up a survey, and that's isn't this awesome right here. Uh, Warren put up a survey. Uh, it's in an email. He wants you guys just to let him know how you're feeling, how you're thinking, how things are going, uh, that kind of thing. Make sure you fill out that survey. Get it in. I don't really know what we're going to be doing with it, but it's going to be a lot of fun. All right. I'm not going to hold you guys up anymore. I'm going to let you come on in here and hear what Warren has to say. Good morning. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed the time this morning so far. I know I always enjoy just spending time in worship. Uh, maybe you were able to, to join in and sing along with, with Brittany and the, and the team this morning. But I, I, I just think it, you know, worship is one of those things that we do that prepares us for another time of worship. For another time of worship, for another time of worship. Because whether it's in giving, whether it's in serving, whether it's in preaching, it really is all an expression of worship to who our God is. And, and hopefully this morning you're in that, in that place and in the presence of God and allowing the Holy Spirit just to speak to you and ready you for what God wants to say here this morning. And hopefully he's already been talking. Um, through our time here today. And, you know, it's exciting to think about what God's doing. And even as we're, we're looking at coming back together here very, very shortly, and even it might be differently than how we've done it in the past, but eventually, hopefully it'll be something of, of normal. But, but right now, we're excited about the thought of just coming together here coming up in June. And I think, you know, when we look at what Paul is speaking to the church, it's always, it's always coming together, a people coming together and being on mission. And, and I think some of that is, is lost when we find ourselves always apart from one another. And so it's exciting to think about uh, what God wants to do with us in, in the coming days as we see what, you know, God's called us to here in Lebanon and on mission field even around the entire world. Now, last week, Gary was talking and continuing in Philippians as we're in this series called Thrive. And maybe some of you feel like, I haven't been thriving very well these last number of months. Or others like, you would not believe it. I have testimony after testimony how God's been in the midst of this. And, and so wherever you might be, I think the, the, the key to thriving isn't so much our position as much as it's his position. And us joining him that no matter where we're at, that we are thriving because of who God is in the midst of the storm, in the midst of the, the rainbow, in the midst of the mountaintop, whatever it might be that we thrive because of who we are in Christ Jesus. And last week, you know, Gary talked about pressing in and the value and the importance of a people that are, that are on mission, that are saying, hey, Jesus has done this in our lives, and now we, in response to that, live a life sold out for Jesus Christ. We are all in for being a people that are called by his name to extend the kingdom of God, to be on mission, on mission together. And I think one thing that's, that's super important is that the more that we, we understand and know who he is and what he is doing and what he has done radically change the things that we do, the things that, that God's called us, us to. I know in, in John 17 verse 3, it says, and this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ. It's that knowing, that understanding of who he is that compels us to that sense of eternity and, and, and eternal life. And this morning we're talking about our journey. We're talking about that which we've been, we've been set on fire by the Holy Spirit, and now we're on mission, on journey to fulfill what God wants to do with us as individuals, but also as a church. And I think the church needs to press into knowing the gospel, knowing Jesus Christ. So, so if you want a good attitude when others are against you, read, read Luke 22 and 23 where Jesus responds to being crucified. Here he is, an innocent man, and he says this, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And so in knowing him changes how we might face circumstances, how we might face suffering ourselves. You want to understand the difference between a husband and a wife. In Ephesians 5 and 6, it talks clearly about the differences, how God created us uniquely to love one another, to care for one another. If you want to know how to forgive those that have sinned in plain sight, you read John 8, verse 1 through 11. And feel the power of forgiveness when others stand to accuse and condemn you. Jesus says, he who is without sin, let him cast the first stone. If you want to deal with pride and selfish ambition, read Matthew 13 when Jesus picks up a towel and begins to wash between the disciples' toes. Here he is, the Messiah, serves 
lays his life down. And, and soon after this, he does. He lays his life down for the disciples. If you want to know how to relate to government authority, read Matthew 22. And hear how Jesus responds to entrapment when they're trying to, to trick him into, in, into doing something that they're thinking, hey, here he is preaching a certain way. Maybe if, if we ask him about Caesar and about authority, that maybe this is going to mess him up, and he doesn't do that at all. Rather, he knew that all authority is given by God, and give to Caesar what is Caesar, and to God what is God's. And that, that whole sense of, of him knowing how to walk through life, and that we, knowing him, are saying, hey, I, I'm discovering how to walk through life too, because I'm discovering who Jesus is. And, and that's the power of the gospel. That's the power of the good news. That, that, we're, that we're learning and discovering who he is and what he has done. And then we then attribute those things to our own actions. And it changes the things that we do and the way that we act. Because knowing Jesus will change you. The evidence that you know him is that you want more of him. Once you know him, it becomes this hunger, this desire to know more of him. When people are disinterested in the God that saved my life, it tells me that they don't know him yet. When, when you're disinterested in, in, in what God is doing, it just means you don't know him. Is that you don't spend time with him. You haven't gotten to really understand who, who he is. It tells me that you know of him, but don't know him now, how many of you have watched the episodes of The Last, um, I think it's called The Last Dance? Uh, obviously, I don't know if you're raising your hand. I'm assuming some of you have actually watched this, and, and I think it's in episodes 9 and 10. It's been going for a little while now. It's a story of, of Michael Jordan. It's a documentary that's, that's on, on TV, and, and in this documentary, there, there's a, a, a getting to, to know who he is, who Michael Jordan is. Now, now maybe even in, in your homes, I could say, hey, you might even turn to your child and say, hey, do you know who Michael Jordan is? I, go, Man, I don't even know who Michael Jordan is. And you're thinking, are you kidding me? Michael Jordan is one of the greatest basketball players that ever lived. Now, now you might say that, but in reality, you don't know him either. I mean, you, you might be able to say, well, I've watched him and I've, and I've heard of him, but do you know him? I remember when I was playing basketball, I used to shoot a jump shot with my tongue hanging out to imitate Michael Jordan. I didn't know him, but I watched him and I'm like, oh man, I want to be like Mike. But the question that we have to ask ourselves, are, are we a people that just know of Jesus Christ, that, that, that have heard the stories, that, that, have, that have been in church for so long, that kind of can even articulate some of the truths, but yet do you really know him have really made him lord of everything have really got to know him personally and intimately have we had that song of solomon type of a relationship with him that 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 that, that romance that that love for him just continually every morning buds up and and, and your heart flutters and your and, and you and you start thinking about him you get excited about spending the day with jesus is, is that our lives or is it that sense of well yeah when when, when i'm when someone brings him up, I, I have references, I have memories. I, I think we need to be challenged to say, I know who he is. Have you ever had someone say to you, oh, I know about God? You know, you're talking to him, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah I know about God. And, and what that's supposed to do, it's supposed to actually deter you or lessen your, your impact or your thought. That's, oh, okay, okay, you know about him, I don't need to share. Then I don't need to share because you know him. When in reality, it should do just the opposite. It should stir us when someone says, oh, I know about God. Don't worry. It's like, well, wait, wait a minute. <laughs> let, let, let me walk through this with you, and let's discover if you truly know the God that I'm talking about. Because I think we can say, do you know God? And people love to just say, oh yeah, God, this, God, that. But in reality, they don't know the God that we're speaking of. The God that's radically changed our lives. The God that's impacted us every single day. The God that, that breathes new life in us through the Holy Spirit and empowers us to be a, a witness and empowers us to be a, a loving and caring towards our spouse, towards our kids, to be a great um, worker, a great boss, a great um, friend, a great neighbor, a great, you know, all those things. It's because of Jesus Christ, because of what he has done. And knowing him changes that. Knowing him impacts, impacts that. And I said, church, do you know Jesus? Is he the one you boast about? You know, Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24 says, Thus says the Lord. It says, Thus says the Lord. Let not the wise man boast of his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast of his strength. Let not the rich man boast of his riches. But let him who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows me. For I am the Lord that practices 
steadfast love, justice, righteousness in the earth. And in these things I delight, declares the Lord. If we're going to boast, boast in knowing him. Boast in not the things that we have in our own, our strength, our wisdom, you know, those things. No, our riches. I, I boast that, that I know him. I know Jesus Christ and him who died for me, who was crucified, who rose from the dead. Let that be the thing that comes off of our lips when we talk about the things we're proud about, things we're excited about, the things that, that make me unique, special because I'm a child of God. I pray, Holy Spirit, burn a fire within our church. Lord, challenge us as lukewarm people, as people that are, that are disinterested or apathetic or, or, or just in, in the routine of life. Lord God, breathe on us in such a way to ignite a flame in us that, that brings a desire and a passion within us that cannot be quenched by circumstances, by coronavirus, by whatever might come our way, that it cannot dampen what we have in Christ Jesus. It, it cannot lessen what we have. You know, there's a, a story in Daniel, in Daniel chapter 4 and 5. And there's this scene of, of Belshazzar. And he's having this big party. He's got, thou, he's got a thousand leaders there with him. And they're gathering around. And, and what he does is that he, he tells his servants to go grab the, the elements, the, the, the glasses, and, and let, let's out, out of the out of the treasury that from the, from the captivity of, in Jerusalem when they, when they took, went into the temple and they actually captured some of those articles. And he says, hey, so let's bring those things out here. And so they're, they're filling them with wine. They're drinking them. And it wasn't so long ago when, when Nebuchadnezzar was on all fours out in the wilderness for seven years groveling around because of his pride and his arrogance, of his disregard for who God is. Who, for who God is. It says in, in verse 33 of chapter 4 in Daniel, it says, He was driven from among men and ate grass like an ox, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hair grew as long as eagle's feathers and his nails were like bird's claws. That's pretty crazy when, when you think about it. But, but, listen, but listen to Nebuchadnezzar's response. At the end of the period of time of seven years, he says this. And I, and I would hope this would be the very thing that today we would say. The very thing that would come out of our lips when we think about who God is. When we think about how powerful God is, the most high God, and what he has done and how he has authority over all things. That This is how we would articulate this truth. It says, at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven and my reason returned to me. And I blessed the most high. And praise and honored him who lived forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion. And his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing. And he does according to his will. Among the hosts of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand. Or say to him, what have you done? And this was not an unfamiliar story. You know, we look at even the people group at that time, stories passed down from generation to generation to generation. And so Nebuchadnezzar, what happened with him wasn't unfamiliar. It wasn't something that Belshazzar wouldn't have heard of. But apparently, he was at a place where he disregarded it. He had lost respect or regard for the past, of what those before him had walked through, those before him had learned. You know, so, so, some say whether, whether Nebuchadnezzar was a, was a grandfather, or was, or was just a, a patriarch, or was someone that, that was just um, the succession of the, king, of the kingly reign within Babylon, no matter how um, that all t- took place, we realize that this story was a relevant story that I can imagine as a young boy, Belshazzar had heard of. And here he is in the moment, you know, now he's king of the most powerful nation. And we realize that at this moment, in in his lack of humility, his kingdom is lost. Daniel was 
was speaking to him as, as the, the queen mother reminded Belshazzar, as, as the writing took place on the wall and, and, and at that moment the queen mother said, oh, I know of someone and Daniel comes forward and Daniel reminds Belshazzar of Nebuchadnezzar, he reminds him of the God that he has disregarded. It says, but the God in whose hand is your breath and whose are all your ways you have not honored. Belshazzar, the, the successor that says this, have not, you have not humbled your heart. Though you knew all these things, though you knew all these things, but you have lifted up yourself against the Lord of heaven. At that moment, God broke in and wrote on the wall, many, many, Tekel Parson, and it says this in verse 26, this is the interpretation of the matter. Many, God has numbered the days of your kingdom and brought it to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balance and found wanting. Press, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. And that very night, the Medes came in and took over and he was slain. One day we are going to be weighed and measured. We're going to stand before the God of all creation in all of eternity. Will our name be written in the book of life? Or are those that, that are found wanting because what? They lack the name of Jesus Christ as Lord of their life. There may be some of you watching this that, that have never have never had an encounter with Jesus Christ and made him Lord of everything. And at that moment, at the end of time, how will you be weighed? How will you be measured? It can be based off of the things that you have done. The only people that stand before God Almighty are those that have Jesus Christ as their salvation. Jesus Christ as their righteousness. Jesus Christ is one that has motivated us to good works, that has motivated us to live a new life, that has motivated us, motivated us to live differently every single day. That the Bible is full of those that walked before us, those that, that walked in the knowing of who Jesus Christ is. There's fathers and mothers of Israel, Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Rebekah, Jacob, Rachel, Leah, Moses and Aaron, judges and kings of Israel and Judah. God himself, Jesus, walking among us. What an example. The disciples. We can learn from them. We should be students to know the God of our fathers. This is, this is a huge deal. You know, we, we live in an age, we live in an age where the truth of our fathers and mothers is considered irrelevant. We've dumbed down the past and elevated the progressive thought. I know in the 80s, in the time when I was going to school, there I go, I just dated myself. So in the 80s, there's a sociology class that I took, my brother took, and in that class, yeah, they're instructing us and telling us that we need to tear down the walls of the truth of our fathers and our mothers and, and the family heritage and things that they've taught us. And you need, to, you need to put those away and you need to create for yourself your own truth, your own identity. You know, and I think we, we can get caught up in that. Uh, of something about something, building something, something new. But just because it's new doesn't make it, make it true. Being progressive doesn't make you right. You know, I just finished a book, and it's right here. It's called The Coddling of the American Mind. It says in here, how good intentions and bad ideas are setting up a generation for failure. It's actually a really, a really good read. If you want to kind of go, how, how, how do we get where we are in our universities and our colleges today? How do we end up <laughs> with these type of, uh, of students that, that, that have a hard time just, just, just walking together and having differences and rather than all of a sudden having these, th these moments of where you just burst out and you're freaking out because of someone doesn't agree with what you're thinking. And, you know, in this book, it talks about three things. It says there's three bad ideas or untruths that have, that, have, that have fertile ground in our universities and our colleges. And one of them is that, that what doesn't kill you makes you weaker. That we have to do away with any suffering, any struggle, any competition, any opposition. 
Now, what doesn't kill, because we used to say, right, what doesn't kill you makes you what? Stronger. But now it's just the opposite. If there's something that, that, that opposes you, that you, have to, you have to fight for, you have to contend for, you say, hey, that's going to make me weak. There's also a, a prevailing thought that says, always trust your feelings. Are, are, are you kidding me? Always trust your feelings. Well, we're so concerned with, with people's feelings and, and how they're processing through things and, and, and what's being said and what's being done around them that we have to make sure that, that everything around them is comfortable and that we don't, we, we don't allow your feelings to be hurt. And so even like Gary talked about last week is that what happens is that we want to we adjust and change the road rather than teaching our students how to, how to walk the road and deal with the, with the speed bumps and the, and the potholes and the, and the sharp turns. Instead, we want to just strain it all out and, and put beds of flowers along the way and, and spray perfume everywhere we go. And so it's like dancing through daisies. And that's not even life. That's not even reality. But yet we're, we're setting people up to think that, that we can create that for you. And we're going to be so uber sensitive about your feelings that we're going to change every aspect of how we, how we do life. The thirdly is this, is life is a battle between good people and evil people. We can no longer sit across from someone. We can no longer sit across from someone that thinks differently, believes differently, sin differently than we do. And just have a conversation because now we don't see them as just another person thinking differently. We actually see them as an evil person. We actually see them as someone that wants to attack me. And then we get this word microaggression, right? We turn something in where all of a sudden something that, that isn't even aggre- aggressive is something that we're, what we're doing against somebody. Rather than something that just accidentally happens, we wouldn't consider if I walked along the road and all of a sudden I bumped into you, you wouldn't consider that microaggression. You wouldn't just think that aggressive. I'd say, hey, I apologize. I didn't mean to offend you. But now that doesn't work. Now if we hear something that offends me, even though it wasn't intended, I consider that an aggression against me. I mean, look, we've changed it. And like it says, we're coddling of the American mind. Now how good intentions and bad ideas are setting up a generation for failure. Paul says to the church in Rome, he says, do not conform to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That by testing you may discern what is the will of God. What is good and acceptable and perfect. That there's testing that goes on. That, there's, that there is this sense of, of knowing and, and, and walking through and, and even being confronted with opposition and thinking that's not necessarily bad. It, it actually confirms and it helps us and, and to understand and know who God is. Paul in, in, in the Philippians here is teaching the people how to live a life consistent to what they believe about Jesus. It says, avoid selfish ambition through humility. Persevere through suffering. Don't be persuaded by those who would teach a different gospel. Press onward, forward, take a hold of the life we have in Christ Jesus. Allow all that Christ has done to change all that you do. He's done his part. Now we're to walk out our salvation, to work out our salvation, our new life. Paul says in Philippians 3, 14 through 21, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Our lives are all heading somewhere. I, either we're, we're pressing on heavenward because Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. And we can look for eternity with Christ. Or we'll receive the prize of pressing into all we have in ourselves, which is eternal separation from God. We're, 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 going, we're going somewhere. Our prize as a Christian is heaven. It's what awaits us. It, it, it's that which makes the journey a blast because you know there's something more ahead of us, that this isn't all there is, that this doesn't even compare to what is to come. And so we can enjoy whatever it is. We, we can walk in the joy, even in the suffering and the challenges. We can say, hey, but, but this is all temporary. This isn't eternal. This isn't where I live. This isn't, this isn't my, my hope is in this life. No, my hope is in what's to come. Pressing on what Christ Jesus has, has for me. You know, I was watching a movie when I was growing up that I just, I just loved in the 80s, and it was The Chariots of Fire. I don't know if you remember that. But The Chariots of Fire, you have Eric Little, and you have um, um, Abrams. I can't remember his first name. But anyway, and, and they were running this race, and, and here's these two guys. This is like 1924 or so. And they're, they're running this race in the Olympics, 
And, and before the Olympics, they, they ran against each other. You have to watch the movie to kind of see how they didn't actually run against each other in the Olympics. But yet they both won gold medal in the Olympics. Now, this is a, a, a true story. And, but but in, the, in the movie portion, it shows this competition when they're running. And, and Abrams turns during one of the races as Eric Little, they were running the 100, right? And he turns, and as he turns, Little passed him. And, 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 that, and that's one of those fundamental errors that when you're running in, in a track race, that you keep your eye forward towards the mark, towards the prize. You don't turn in the midst of, because you, you, you lose your stride. You, 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 it, it bri- well, now you might be thinking, you don't, Warren, you don't have a clue what you're talking about. I can see you in the camera. Now, my, my son would tell you that it's important for you to keep your eye moving forward, all right? So I'm speaking for him. But I, but I think it's important that we realize that even as a Christian, as we're pressing on, we're pressing forward, that we set our eyes on him. That we realize that we're running a race, that we're to finish the race. Even as Paul talks about in 2 Timothy 4 and verse 7, when he's talking to Timothy, and the importance of that, that I fought a good fight, that I finished the race, that I've done everything that I've been called to do. Man, what a joy it is to know there's a finish line, to know that someday we're going to cross it. Now, now, I, I, now, I don't know about you, but I'm not all for let's, let's hurry this thing along. There are too many people that are alive today that if Jesus came back tomorrow, they're going straight to hell. That, that's not a good thing, people. That's not something we're like, whoa, I can't wait. Are you kidding me? It's like that's what we're called to as a church, to be an example, to be a testimony, to be people that are full of the good news of Jesus Christ. And so that way we can say, hey, come with us. There's good news. There's something ahead of us that we're moving forward, we're pressing onward toward. This is not all there is. That's a good message. You can preach that one. Philippians 3.15 says, let those of you who are mature think this way. And if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Then he says, only let us hold true to what we have attained. Live your life in the truth you've discovered in Christ Jesus. Let it impact your journey. Even as Gary was talking about last week. Let, let, Let it change the way we do life here on earth. Paul continues by saying, brothers, join in intimate, excuse me, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you, you have in us. For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly and their glory in their shame. And this is with minds set on earthly things. Paul here is, again is warning the church about those that would oppose the cross that there's an underlying opposition in the day that even the church was living in here in Philippi that that is happening even in today. That how important it is to know that there are those that oppose us, but it's not oppose us, but it's not that we need to fear it. We just need to know it. It's not that we're afraid of those that would be in opposition of us, but we need to know there's opposition opposed to what Jesus Christ would call us to do. It says here what identifies those people. It says their minds are set on earthly things. Paul's already said that anything other than Christ is worthless, right? He calls it, he says, I count it as rubbish. Here's a good exercise that I would, and now some of you, or maybe all of you won't do this, but you should. It's a good exercise. is Is take a moment, make a list, and on the list, just put down those things that you would consider earthly. Those things that you would consider earthly in your own. Now, I'm not talking about things that, that are not part of like doing drugs. That's earth. No, I'm talking about stuff in your own life like, like possessions, money, career, education, marriage, family. Now, some well, wait a minute. Marriage is earthly? Yeah, you're not married. We're married to Christ in heaven. And, and so that entertainment, other things. Now, and then make a, another list next to that one that says a list of those things that you would consider heavenly. God the Father, like Jesus Christ the Son, like the Holy Spirit, like, like the church, which is the body of Christ, which is the, the church is being married to the bride. There, there, there's an awesome heavenly celebration taking place. The kingdom of God, which is eternal. The gospel, the good news that, that bridges earth and heaven. Now, you have these two lists, right? Now you, now you take a highlighter and you highlight the things you think about the most. 
I highlight the things, if you were to go down that list, think, oh, here's what I think about above it. And, and, and just see if, if most of the highlights are in the things of this earth or if they're in the things of heaven. What do you set your mind on? Colossians 3, 1 through 3, says, If then you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, which Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. It says, set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. I mean, Paul knew that this wasn't just something for one church. This is something for the church to realize that we've got to set our mind on things above. For you've died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. The truth of this may be challenging for us to to look at that list and realize, oh man, I have marked way too many things on the things of this earth. But, but But here's what's awesome and here's what's so encouraging. We've already read this verse, but it says this. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. So, so maybe you're still thinking this, maybe our maturity level, we're still going, man, I'm, I'm really putting a lot of, of effort and energy in my mind into these things of the earth. It says, oh God, help me, change me. Lord, allow me, illuminate, reveal to me how I can set my mind on the things that are above. No matter what your list may look like, is that God has gifted us with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit that is, that is working in you to reveal those things that are heavenly. That will help us, lead us into the truth that sets our minds on things, things that are eternal rather than things that are of this earth. Have you ever heard someone said, I've set my mind on it? It means what? I'm going to make it happen. You know, I've, I've set my mind on that. I want to make sure that gets, yeah, you know, okay, I, I've set to do that. I'm, I'm thinking about that. I'm going to make sure that happens. I'm going to get it done. I'd say, church, allow the Holy Spirit to change what our mind is set on. That our mind becomes set on those things towards heaven. And you watch what happens with the things on earth. It'll change how we do things. It'll change how we walk through things. It'll change how we think things that are important all of a sudden don't become as important. And when that happens, when things go sideways or something happens, we don't freak out and lose our mind. We realize, hey, these are just the things of this earth. These are things, yeah, we can walk through, we can learn, we can discover. But the Holy Spirit's going to help us because there are greater things than these that await us. I, I, I just want to close with this, with this thought. Paul's addressing some things that will help the church, will help us today. He says, the journey we are on is full of opposition. It's not a bad thing, but it's reality. It's not changing the road, but being prepared for it. That even as we, we look at the stuff that we're facing with the coronavirus and other things, we can say, man, that changes this, just changes that. It's like, yeah, but it doesn't, it doesn't change who I am in Christ Jesus. It doesn't change what Jesus Christ has done for me. It doesn't change the new life that I have every single day and how I can relate to other people. It's like, yeah, maybe it changes how I do this and how I go to the store. Whatever. It doesn't matter in the scope of eternity. Maturity is not a a destination, but a journey. Life today is meaningful because of where we are headed tomorrow. It's not a destination, but a journey. We're on this journey. Here's the thing. The last is our destination, heaven, defines our journey. How you travel has everything to do with where you are going. Do we get that? How we travel has everything to do with where you are going. If you're going to heaven, it changes how we run the race. It changes how we deal with life. It changes everything. Our destination reshapes the way that we run. You know, we shouldn't be shocked when we see people that are running aimlessly. Because their destination, where they're going, is different than ours. And what we're illuminating to people is there's a different destination awaiting you in Christ Jesus. That's the good news. That's what's exciting about being a Christian. That that we live in the perspective of eternity. We're a kingdom people. 
I just wrote this in closing. Church, let the gospel and the power of the Holy Spirit bring change. Let's get excited that the home stretch of the race is going to be our best leg. Not looking to the past, but finishing with a heavenly kick. It's, it's like that home stretch. When I watch my son run around, he runs the 400. And I watch that, I, I'm, I'm waiting, I'm waiting. So, okay, wait, here it comes, here it comes, here it comes. Because he knows the last part of the race is going to be his best. Oh, church, let that be the truth for us as we're living our life, as we're excited about what God's doing. That I don't care how old you are or how young you are, that you think about, Lord, that every step of the way as we're on this journey, that there's still yet the finish line to come. And we're excited about the kick. We're excited about running that race all the way across the finish line. Man, it's a joy to realize that we're heaven bound. It's a joy just to hear Paul speaking to the church and really he's speaking to us. That we set our minds on the things above. We we focus on the things of heaven. And it gets us excited about the things of this earth. Because our destination is awesome. I mean, let me pray for you this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you, thank you, thank you. Or that you've changed the way we run the race. You've changed everything. God, I I pray that we get excited about this journey that we're on. No matter what comes along the way, God, you've prepared us for this, for such a time as this. We're good, Lord, because we're so secure, so confident in who you are in us. And Lord, I pray that that joy just overflows and it just permeates through us and infects and affects people around us. Lord, we just glory in you. Thank you, Jesus, just for what you do. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for walking alongside of us. You do that best. Lord, you you invite us to keep step with you. You invite us, Lord, just allow us to be in this relationship with you. We say thanks, Holy Spirit. Lord, we just delight in you. Bless us this day in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Amen. God bless you. Have an amazing day amazing week. Hey everyone, I just want to say thanks a lot for watching the video today. Really appreciate that. One thing you can do to help us out is by subscribing to this channel and then hitting, you know, the bell, uh, notifications, making a comment. The more that that happens, the easier it is to find us. So, If you can help us out, that would be great. Thanks again for watching us today. Have an awesome, awesome day.